Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay, sweet. Okay, you can do that. Okay. So how's it going, everybody? I hope you guys are doing well. Nice. Um, <laughs> Alpha is doing very well. Uh, before I get started, uh, I know that Amelia made an announcement about the Brain Center. If you're interested in neural engineering or neuroscience, feel free to check it out. Shameless plug. Uh, but if you want some mentorship from your upperclassmen, we can, um, you know, pair you with high schoolers to give you some leadership experience. And we're also trying to connect people with, uh, you know, neural engineering research positions and also neurotech in uh, industry internships. So if you're interested, check it out. But now for the fun stuff, let us hop right into the recitation. Okay. So our problem for today, or the first problem of today, we have this differential equation. Let me write it out real quick. Okay, and then we have some information that this differential equation basically governs the input and output of a stable LTI system. So input and output for stable LTI system. And the actual question itself tells us to determine the impulse response. Now, do you guys know what an impulse response is? Somebody unmute or type in the chat. What do you think an impulse response is? Conceptually or in this in the sense of this problem? What is an impulse response, guys? Does anybody know? Like, can they see stops on sale that when I have impulse response, this <laughs> is more than I need? Exactly. Actually, not that impulse response. That's going to be another impulse response. But that's pretty close, Alpha. That's pretty close. Okay, I'm going to call on people. Let's see. You guys have five seconds. Otherwise, I'm going to call on some very unlucky individual. What is an impulse response, guys? Jay, do you know what impulse response is? Uh, is the impulse response essentially the response you get by putting in uh, a signal like a delta function? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Jade, you're promoted to something. You're promoted. Let's go. So basically, you have this input. You input it into some black box, some system, and you get some output. And H of T basically governs, it's a property of the system. So it's how the system is going to respond to X of T. How is it going to respond to an input? And so basically how we can find this is we want to try to get, uh, by using the Fourier transform, we want to get Y of J omega over X of J omega. So that's this is the end goal here. Okay. And very briefly, how we got that is by x of t involved with h of t, and we get y of t. And then after that, we do the Fourier transform. We get x of jw, j omega times uh, h of j omega equals y of j omega. And then we just solved for h of j omega. So that's how we got that, guys. OK? So now the first step. Now that conceptual background is done, the first step is actually going to be to take the Fourier transform of this. So right now we're in the time domain because you see in parentheses, we have T. So we're in the time domain. We have Y of T here, right? Let me change colors. That's horrible, right? We see T here, T here. So we do the Fourier transform. And for this guys, you're gonna really wanna lean on those Fourier, um, both the Fourier pair and Fourier transform tables, right? So I have it, you know, here myself, but I don't think anybody memorizes it. So 
here, right? So we have um, y of t and taken to the second derivative. So we're going to have jw squared and it's gonna be times y of j omega. And how I got this was from the property table, guys. We have the derivation property and it's to the second power because taking the second derivative, that's why it's squared. Here we have plus 12, j omega, y of j omega. Here, guys, just to make it painfully obvious, we, 12 is from here. Once again, this jw, j omega, is from the derivation property. And so we got that. And then we have this. Similarly, we're just changing the variable from y to x. OK, so everyone feels pretty good about this. Feel free to unmute or type in the chat if you're if you're still stuck. But basically, we just did the Fourier transform on this. And how we got this was from the properties table. So definitely lean on that, guys. OK, so then we're going to do some just some algebraic manipulation. Our goal, remember, is to get y of j omega over x of j omega. So we're going to factor out everything we can. So here, we can simplify this to y of j omega. And then we basically just pull it out. And then similarly, we just pull out the x of j omega. OK, and now we're looking pretty good because we can just divide by x of j omega on this side and then divide by all this stuff um, on the left. So then what we get, we get y of j omega over x of j omega. Once again, we just divide both sides by x of j omega to get that, right? So that cancels. And then we get this equal to j omega plus 2. So this all over the left side. We just divided both sides by this huge blob here, guys. OK, so everyone's feeling pretty good. And then we're just going to distribute this. So one more simplification step, guys, and we get j omega plus 4 and j omega plus 8. We just basically factored it. OK, and this is the same thing as saying h of j omega, which is our transfer function. <sighs> OK, but we're not yet complete, guys, because we have this h of j omega, but um, we really want it to be in the time domain. So we have this, and that's great, but we have to do, I guess, one more step, okay? So once you see two separate terms in the denominator being multiplied and you're working for a transform, odds are you're going to have to do what's called partial fraction decomposition. So <clears throat> let me see real quick. Um, sorry, give me just one second. Yes, yeah, so we can actually just go one step further, guys. We can actually do one more simplification step. So here, we're just doing plus eight minus six, which gives us this, it's the same as two. And our goal here is to kind of simplify even further and cancel one of the terms on the, on the denominator by pulling it out. So let me show you here real quick. Right, and then now we can kind of pull this guy off. And then minus six. So here's just one more simplification step, guys. And the reason we do that is because it makes our partial fractions way easier. Let me write it down here. Because when you have, um, once again, when we have this j omega up top, it'll make the partial fractions a little tougher. And we'll go into that in just one second. Just a little meter. 
Okay, so everyone following me so far, any questions, guys? I think I kind of rushed through that, but everyone feels pretty good on the math. So just to recap, took the Fourier transform, did some fancy math, and using the Fourier properties table, and our goal is to find y of j omega over x of j omega to get the transfer function, or the, sorry, the, um, the impulse response, right? And so now we see that there's two things in the denominator. We're trying to do the, the inverse Fourier to get it in the time domain again, and we're gonna have to do partial fractions. But here we just did a simple simplification to make it a little easier, okay? So here are these cancel. Okay, sweet. So before I go into the partial fractions, I'm going to drop a YouTube video into the chat. This is the most insane YouTube video of all time. If you have some time, it's pretty long. It's like 32 minutes, but um, this guy goes over all the different types of partial fractions. So right now what we have here is called just linear factors, but you can actually get uh, repeated linear factors where you have something like j omega plus four squared, or if the omega itself was squared. So there's a lot of different types of partial fractions. You can have the, the top being a higher power or the same power, right? And all those change how you're going to do partial fractions. And I would say that all those might be fair game for homework or tests or anything. So, and it's just a useful skill to have under your belt. So if you have the time, definitely give it a watch. It's a two times speed kind of video. So now we're going to hop into the actual partial fractions. So you'll get to see an example right here too. So basically, we're going, only going to be, do, to be doing partial fractions on this guy right here. So we're going to put this to the side for a second, and we're going to try to just decompose this guy. Because looking at the Fourier, inverse Fourier transform table, it's way easier to have just one, one term here. By having two terms here, it makes it, you know, at least based off of the table, hard to do an inverse Fourier transform. So our goal is to separate this into two terms. So now we're going to be doing... partial fractions of just this guy. So don't forget that we still have this term here, but we're gonna put it to the side for now. Okay. And once again, guys, if you're confused or anything, feel free to let me know, okay? So basically what we're gonna do is we're going to say that this guy over here is the same as a over j omega plus four plus b over j omega plus eight. So what we're doing is we're kind of breaking this down into two separate, uh, I guess, terms based on these terms here, okay? And we have to solve for what a and b are. So how we're gonna do that is we're basically going to multiply everything by j omega plus four and j omega plus eight. So what I mean by that is we're going to multiply, I'll just rewrite it in a different color actually. By multiplying each term by j omega plus four and j omega plus eight, all the denominators are going to cancel and we can solve for what a and b are going to be. So something like this. So we're going to multiply every single term by that. Once again, guys, this is called partial fraction decomposition. So then this cancels, and this cancels, and all of this cancels. So what we're left with is six equals a times j omega plus eight. Remember this canceled, the plus four canceled. So now it's being multiplied by the j omega plus eight. And same goes for here. For the b term, the j omega plus eight canceled. So now we're on j omega plus four. Okay, so then just doing some distribution. Okay, so then what we can do is now we look at these terms and we can compare the left and the right to see um, which terms have uh, a variable and which terms don't. So what I mean by that is here, we see that on the left side, we have six that doesn't have any variable. So we compare it to everything on the right side that also doesn't have a variable. So here, this 4b, 
has no variable. And by variable, I don't mean A and B, I mean the J omega, right? That was an initial variable. So that's kind of like with respect to what we're what we're working with. So here we can make two equations to solve for A and B. The first one has no J omega. So we're gonna say six is equal to eight A plus four B. And how I got that is because once again, all these terms don't have any J omega. And now we can also say that zero is equal to A plus B because there are no terms on the left side that have a J omega, there's nothing here. And the A and B here have a J omega attached. So what we end up getting guys, I won't go through this whole math just to save some time. But what we end up getting is that A is equal to negative three halves, or excuse me, positive three halves, and B is equal to negative three halves. And it's pretty important to remember which uh, term was A and B, because you have to go back here and plug it in. So we're going to go back here to our initial equations here. So we said that A over J omega plus four now becomes three halves over J omega plus four. And similarly, we have B over J omega plus eight now becomes negative three halves over J omega plus eight. So going back to our initial impulse response, guys, and uh, it was a long time ago, even I forgot where it was, right up here. Hey guys, any, any questions, by the way? Here's somebody's mic, any questions, guys? So now we're going to substitute this guy with what we just did. What we get just doing some simplification guys this is going to be our we're not done with part a but this is going to be our final impulse response so we're going to make a big note of this big asterisk okay so this is not our answer but we're still gonna highlight it so we can remember it okay so now the whole point of this guys was so that there were only one term on the denominator so we can do the inverse Fourier transform easily. That was the whole point of this. That's why we're doing it. So now we can take the Fourier inverse to get our impulse response in the time domain. So by taking the inverse Fourier transform here, we can say h of t is equal to e to the minus 4t. And once again, guys, this is going off the properties table. It's definitely on this. Don't try to memorize anything unless you want to, but you're much more likely to make a mistake. Okay. And then after that, so guys, I'm just breezing over this. Does anybody want me to go a little slower or do you guys feel good about this? I know you guys have already done a lot of Fourier transforms, but I can go over the steps individually for how I got this answer or we can just proceed. How do you guys feel? Do you know how I got this answer? We'll pause here for a sec, guys. Everyone feel good about how I did this? One check. Hi, bro. Hey, Ruby. Wait. Isn't uh, the H to be a T omega? And, and you go from one over T omega plus four, and then the next step, yeah. it's one, plus, one divided by T omega. So didn't that be a plus four? Yep, yep. Good catch, Ray. Yeah, should be. That was my mistake. Let me rewrite that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's what happens when you rush, Ruby. Look at me. I'm I'm testing you guys, making sure you're all paying attention on your toes. Ruby is passed. She's passed the test. Okay. Everyone feeling pretty good, guys? Okay. And we can always go back if you guys think that you understand it and you don't and you're confused, that's totally fine. Or 
reach out over email. So here's gonna be our HFT. So this is our answer for A. So just do a quick recap. They gave us this differential equation. We were able to do the Fourier transform. We solved for this y of j omega over x of j omega. Then we had to do partial fractions because we had two terms in the denominator. It makes it very hard to do the inverse Fourier transform. So we did partial fractions. And then we ended up getting this bad boy here, in which is the inverse Fourier transform of that to get our answer. Okay. Now I'm gonna move on to part B, guys. Once you have any questions, feel free to interrupt if you do. So for part B, what it's asking is to determine the response of the system. Not the impulse response, but just the response. Okay, so now guys, we have our impulse response. So we know how our, because our system is a linear time invariant, invariant system, we know how our system is going to react for any input, okay? So that was the whole point of that. So now we can change the input and we still know how our system will react because we found the impulse response. So here I've, we've just picked an arbitrary X of T, an arbitrary input, and we're gonna try to you know predict how our system is going to react. And I've forgotten a T here, three minus two T. Okay. So for this, this one's going to be a little easier than the last one. So for here, at least in terms of the amount of work. So the first thing is you always want to put everything into the frequency domain. So we're going to do a Fourier transform. That way we can just multiply, right? That's the benefit. This property of the frequency domain where you have two things, and when you do the Fourier transform, is the same as multiplication. These are big X's, by the way, big X. Okay, we're utilizing this property over and over, and it's very important. So make sure to hammer this into your guys' brains. These are big X's and these are little X's. This is not a T, okay? So we're basically going to utilize this. So the reason we're doing a Fourier transform is so that we can easily just multiply everything together. And it's very nice. Okay. So we're going to Fourier transform this. And what we get is going to be x of j omega is equal to 3 over 2 plus j omega. So that's perfect. And then to get our response, we're basically going to multiply x of j omega by h of j omega to get our y of j omega, okay? So we're solving for our y of j omega, our response. And we know what x of j omega is. We just found it. And we know what h of j omega is because we just found it in the previous problem. Okay, here, but let's do the simplified version. So here, we're going to take this. We're just gonna quickly simplify it, guys. Just combining some like terms. Okay, we're going to keep solving for y of j omega. Now, at this point, it's just algebra. So here, we're going to combine these fractions. We're basically multiplying this guy over here by JW plus eight, and this guy by J omega plus four. Keep saying W, but it's an omega. Okay. 
Everybody following me so far? I know it's halfway through the semester, guys. You guys are doing really great. I promise you, keep up the hard work. It's going to pay off. Okay, so let's keep trucking on. We're just going to keep simplifying. So now we're going to distribute. And I'm going to kind of speed through this, guys, because um, a lot of the signals component you guys have already seen. This part is just algebra. And I think the best way to learn algebra will just be to see these problems on your own and practice them yourselves and then compare your answer with the answer key. So I don't want to spend too much time on this unless you guys have questions. So if you feel like you have no idea what's going on, definitely interrupt me. But if you, you know, are totally fine, I'm just going to power through this. Okay, so just algebra and algebra and algebra, just combining like terms, distributing. So now we get something like this. We're just going to multiply the two fractions together. Okay, and now we did all of that just to do partial fractions again. So let's do some partial fractions. All right, so once again, our goal is to break this into two separate terms, one with JW, uh, J omega over four, um, plus four and one with J omega plus eight. So we're going to write that here. And we're gonna say that this term is equal to an arbitrary constant over J omega plus four. Well, it's not arbitrary, but arbitrarily defined for now, J omega plus eight. And now we're gonna multiply everything by j omega plus four, j omega plus eight. So we can solve for a and b and get rid of those denominators. And as I mentioned previously, I highly recommend to watch that YouTube video. It's very good. Okay, so we're just doing some canceling shenanigans. Now we're gonna solve for a and b guys. So here we have three. And once again, for this A term, these J omega plus four is canceled. So we're multiplying this A with this J omega plus eight. We're multiplying them. Something like this. Similarly for B, J omega plus eight cancel. And now we multiply by J omega plus four. And we're gonna distribute, and make some equations. Okay, so now can anybody help me make these equations? Make sure you guys understand partial fractions because you will most definitely be seeing this later. So if you don't understand it now, the future will be very tough, my friends. Somebody unmute or type in the chat. What are your two equations? Three equals eight A plus four B and zero equals A plus B. And zero equals eight plus four B. Wait, I think I messed up, sorry. One more time, 80. Uh, three equals eight A plus four B and zero equals A plus B. Beautiful, 80. Beautiful, perfect. Okay, so now we can solve for A and B. So, I'm just going to skip this step and we would get a equals three fourths, b equals negative three fourths. Okay, looking good, guys. So now we're going to plug this a and b back into our initial equation, which was up here, right? So we're saying that this term here can be broken down into these two components. So this becomes y of j omega is equal to three fourths over j omega plus four minus three fourths over j omega plus eight. Okay. And now that we have only one term in the denominator, which was the point of that, right? The point of doing the partial fractions, once again, to hammer this is because we had two terms here that we're multiplying. So we'd have a omega squared, which makes the inverse Fourier transform difficult. 
So we do partial fractions to reduce the denominator, right? That's the point, guys. So now everything is easy. Inverse Fourier transform. And by easy, I just mean that these are on the Fourier transform table. We don't have to do any formulas. And then we get y of t is equal to negative 3 fourths e to the minus 8t u of t plus 3 fourths e to the minus 4t u of t. And once again, these are from the Fourier transform tables. And here's our answer, guys. So just to once again recap, we knew our impulse response from part A. We solved for that. And basically, we just said, given this input, x of t, we input it into our system, and we're curious about the response. So we're putting this into our black box. What is the output going to be, right? And we know how our system is going to react from the impulse response, because it's a linear time invariant system. And so we just mul multiply them in the frequency domain or convolve in the time domain, but it's way easier to multiply in the frequency domain. So we multiplied them. And after we multiply and do some partial fractions, we get this guy. And then we just inverse Fourier transform to get it back into the time domain, which is what we're actually interested in. Okay. Any questions, guys? I feel like I breezed through that, but please, please, please speak up if you're confused. I guarantee if you have a question, everyone else does too. Okay. So if there's no questions, I'll pass it to the next the next TA. But if you are looking over your notes and you get confused or you're struggling with anything else, you can feel free to type in the chat or email one of us or all of us or anything. Okay, guys? You're all doing great. Thanks for coming tonight. And is the next person Alpha or is it Amulia, guys? It's Alpha. Alpha. I think she is not in the Zoom call. I think her internet might have gone out. Okay, we're going to have a brief pause, guys. Everyone go get some snacks. Get some snacks, some popcorn, some pretzels or something. Everybody type your favorite snack that you eat while you're watching shows or going to the movies in the chat while we're waiting for Alpha. Oh, Alpha's here. Okay. Oh, wait, were you like waiting for me? Okay. We were waiting. We were waiting. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, let me share my screen. So, um, would you like to try this on um the whiteboard for this question? I think students can participate in this one as well. Yes, let's go. Okay, let's do whiteboard, everyone. But let's look at our question for this one first. Uh, share screen. So yeah, this is uh, this is our question. Can you see my screen, everyone? Give me thumbs up if you can see screen. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, it. we can we see it. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so gonna snip this and let's do this on whiteboard. Is, is basically the same as signal transformation that we've done before. Are you here, everyone? But usually we just, we have been working on um signal transformation, but it's continuous signal in the past, right? So now um we are gonna do that, but with discrete signal. Okay, so let's see how it 
goes copy. Oh. Okay. Hmm. I cannot paste my photo here, but I'm just gonna draw my graph there then. All right. Here, if you wanna help me draw graph, that would be so cool. I'm making an axis here. Five, four, three, two. One zero minus one minus two minus three minus four minus five. Okay, that's for vertical axis two point five two and negative two point five. <gasps> Thank you, Isabella. I'm trying to paste that, but I couldn't. Okay, cool. You can put that there. Okay. So if we have this, let's start with question A. Uh-huh. So I know we've already taken this before. So... What should be the first step we do here? Can anyone give me suggestion? First step. Uh, instead of having just x n, we have now x um negative two n, right? So I just want to transform my graph by applying the negative part to it first. So I want to reflect my graph here. So I'll start with x negative n. Anyone would like to try drawing this graph out? I'll copy the axis. Whoa. Got my axis here. I'm going to put it on this side then because we are flipping the signal, right? Okay. I'm drawing a horizontal line. So, to flip the discrete signal, uh, let's see the point on our original signal here. So, at the border of the signal, we have this one, right? And the position of this used to be at uh, negative 4, while this one is at 4. And this one is zero. So when we flip it, this part just gonna become negative four, and Wait. this part still remains zero. Alpha. Before, right? Hmm? Yeah. Hi. Hi. It says the negative four at point five, not one. Negative four at point five. Not one. Oh no, I'm I'm talking about um the axis now, but yeah, this signal we got to okay. flip still. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So draw that new signal. 
then to not make you confused. Okay. Okay, thank you for the reference. I'm just going to copy what you have down there. <laughs> thank you. Two more. This is just one space. And that is two. Yeah, so we're going to flip it like this. That is going to be at this point. Cool. So our graph, after we flip it, it's going to look like this, right? But now, yeah. Like Ruhi suggests, our... um. The position of our graph is also now changed because we flipped it. So this one used to be at negative 4, right? But now the negative 4 that used to be here used to be negative 4, right? But we flipped it, therefore we um multiply that by negative 1. Therefore, the new position of this edge is going to be 4. Can anyone tell me what would this number be? What would be um the position of this negative? Eight? Yes, thank you, Ruhi. That's right. That's correct. And also, I have this part, the shorter one, as you write, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one. So this part, this one. It's going to be zero. And our vertical, our, ah, uh, uh, yes, vertical st still remain the same. Okay. Now we got this. Thanks for helping everyone. We move to next step. We're going to move to, um, trans, what? Scaling, we're going to move to time scaling. Here. And. Can anyone suggest or tell me what should I do with my graph in this step? I'll make copy for you. Anyone would like to take a guess? Oh yeah, thank you Isabella. Yeah, our signal will shrink but like horizontally. So instead of being um negative four or zero or four, because this thing is multiplied by two inside the bracket, right? Now we're just gonna divide them by two. <gasps> what happened to my pen? We're gonna divide everything by two. Therefore, the this edge is gonna be at negative two, this thing still remains zero. Why this far end is going to be two. Yeah, and that's uh, how a graph is going to look like. Yeah, you see, it's simple. You have done this before. Just make sure you don't get confused. It's easy to get confused sometimes, but you got this one. Okay. Now let's look at um another example. Let's look at B. For B, I have X and over 2 minus 4. Can anyone tell me what should I do first in this case? 
like should they do um um oh n over two first or should they do the minus four part first you should do the minus for part first and you would have to move to, to, to the right. That's right. Thank you so much, Ruhi. So we're going to do xn minus 4 first. Can you tell me what direction should I shift my graph? It's negative, right? Do you remember? Yes, right. Thank you, Ruhi. We shift it to the right. Remember, you got the right to be negative. Okay, now I just need to shift my graph to right-hand side. Okay, by four unit. Mm -hmm. Let me put five. What I do? Okay, I got my exit down. I just make it dramatically long. Uh this is gonna be 2.5. This is zero and this is negative 2.5. I'm gonna copy the shape of my graph from the question over here. Okay. Uh if anyone would like to help me fill in my graph right here you're more than welcome to do so You can, you know what? Yeah, if you want to try feel it, you you can feel from the other side, and I will feel from um. You can feel from the right side. I will feel it from the left side. Okay. Oh, I think I got everything. Thanks, Jade and Isabella, for helping me fill the graph. Beautiful. Now, um, we look at our boundary. So, in our original graph, we started with um negative four, right? But now, since we are moving it for unit by right hand side, can you tell me what the new position would be in this case? What will the leftmost point be? Tick tock, tick tock. Ooh, thank you. I already see somebody writing on the graph. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So if we have originally we have like four on the leftmost side, right? And then we shift right by four unit. So negative four plus four is zero. Thank you. And the rightmost side it was at four, but now we pass this four is now is at eight. And the midpoint is four. 
Cool. Thank you, everyone. Now let's move to the next one. It's scaling part. It's going to be x and over 2 now and divide by 4. I'm going to copy this graph. Can anyone tell me what's going to change when I um have this transformation? What would change? Should I change the vertical axis or should I change the thing in horizontal? And and by how? Oh yes. Thank you, Isabella. Yes. Yeah. So uh we have in our bracket that is divided by two, but we are doing um time scaling here. So stop inside the bracket is gonna be inverse in in our understanding. So yes, if we have divided by two, what we're gonna do with our edge is we're gonna multiply by two. So yes, our leftmost side used to be zero. Now we multiply it by two, we still get zero, right? And we have at a midpoint, we also multiply by two. Now have eight, that's great. And uh, at the rightmost point, we have eight multiplied by two and that's 16. So that's correct, right? See everyone, you got this. It's gonna be exactly the same like what you do in continuous signal. Just make sure you don't get confused like me, okay? And I think that's it for my part. Thank you for participating, everyone. All right. Yep, give me a second. Let me open my iPad. Okay, so for the last and final question, like we said, like right, it's a very similar question to the things that we discussed in class today. And let's get started. You can find the question on Canvas or in your lecture slides. Okay, so we are given that x of n is equal to delta n minus 3 plus 2 delta n minus 2 plus delta n minus 1 plus delta n minus delta n plus 1. And we are given h of n as u of n minus u of n minus 3. Yep. And we are going to find y of n, the output, for the input x of n. So we would be, first, let's plot x of n and see how it looks. Am I audible? Are you all listening? Are you all hearing? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. 
Okay, so now we have delta n minus three, and then this one right here. Then we have two delta n minus two, that one would be here. And we have delta n minus one here and delta n here. So we have our x of n and now, okay, wait. Okay, nice, wonderful. I cannot move this. And now we are going to decompose our x of n into h of n form. And to do that, we would be doing we have delta n minus three becoming This is u of n minus u of n minus three. So when we had only one u of h of n as only one step function, we would just directly convert our delta function into the step function format. So now what we would be doing is we would convert both the functions into the given delta function form. So this is our first function and we would be doing the same for all the given deltas. B two U of N minus two minus two u of n minus five. Then we have delta n minus one. u of n minus one minus u of n minus four. Delta n u of n minus u of n minus three. Next minus delta of n plus one would be negative u of n plus one plus u of n minus two. Is this clear? Any questions? If there are any questions in the chat, I cannot see them. Please speak up. Is it clear? Do we go ahead? Three, two, one. Okay, going ahead. Let's plot all of these. So for the first, plot we would have one two three four five six we have u of n minus three subtracted from u of n minus six so this is the resulting plot for that. And the next plot would be 2u of n minus 2 subtracted from 2u of n minus 5. This is going to be at 2, 3, 4. And next we have u of n minus one subtracted from u of n minus four. 
One, two, three. Next, U of N minus U of N minus For three. The orange one, maybe write the amplitude on that one just to oh, yeah. graph, just to make it clear. Yeah. Well, might as well write the amplitude for all of them. Yeah. That's correct. This would be zero, one, and two. And our last and final plot. Negative u of n plus one subtracted from u of n minus two. Yeah, so this would be minus one, zero, and one. Okay, now. Hey, Amelia? Yeah? Do we graph the minus six, minus five, minus four? Do oh, we just not no. graph? Yes. No, so because when we are plotting them, uh, so this function has got a uh, six, right? When you just plot u of n minus three, that okay. would look like three, four, five, six, right? And this one would start from six, right? Six, seven, eight, and we're subtracting both of them. And because okay. this has six and this has six, both of them are going to get subtracted. We'll be left with only three, four, five. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yep. So now let's add all of these. Oh my God, iPad, what are you doing? Okay, now we are plotting all of these. So we have, let's start from negative one. We just have one amplitude at negative one, that would be zero, wait, zero, one, two, three. Four, five, six. So this would just be an inverted lollipop of minus one amplitude here. And at zero, we have a positive here and a negative here. And we do not have any zero amplitude elsewhere. So we would just be having zero at zero. And at one, we have a negative one, a positive one, and another positive one. So this would result in one. And at two, we have amplitude of one, amplitude of one, and here we have amplitude of two. So that would result in four. And next we have three. At three, we have one, amplitude of two, and then one. So that would also be four. And next we have four. At four, we have two and one. That would result in three. And at five, we are just left with this lollipop that is of amplitude one. So we have one here 
And at six, it's just zero, so it's just zero. This is our final plot for y of n. And now let's also see another method. From here, we can write our y of n as a summation of all of these, right? So let's start from the very left term, negative u of n plus one plus u of n, that is peak at zero, then u of n minus one, plus we have two n minus two terms. So that would be three u of n minus two, and then this is a positive n minus three, and this is a negative n minus three. So those get canceled. And next term is four u of n minus four minus u of n minus five, so two from here, and then this minus u of n minus six. So you might be wondering, there is no n minus three term in this equation here, but in this, we have a peak at n minus three. How is that possible? That is possible because all of these terms, when you plot them and add them, it's going to result in, so we have, negative u of n plus one, which would result in negative amplitudes from minus one. Then we have u of n that would result in little lollipop peaks from zero. Then we have, excuse me, right? Uh -oh u of n plus, no, n minus one. n minus one, that would be from one, two, three, and so on. And next we have u of n minus two. This is an amplitude of three. So this would be three times two, three, four. Next, negative u of n minus four from four. Negative two, oh, oh. This should be a negative. Negative two n minus five be the amplitude is minus two and then we have minus u of n minus six yep it's an inverted lollipop as well so looking at these and if we try to add all of these we would be ending up with our original solution that is this one. Minus one, minus one, zero. One at one or three at one. And next we have four at two, four at three, one or three at four. And then we have one at five and then zero. So try to yourself, add all of these plots and you should be getting this a plot from the previous one. Yes. Yep, and that's it. Do you have any questions? Exiting the whiteboard in three, two,
one. And that's it. That's all for today's recitation. If you have any questions, please stay back and ask us. If you do not have any questions, have a good night. Could one of you stop it?